Farrah Fawcett was born on February 2, 1947, in Corpus Christi, Texas. She was the younger of two daughters. Her mother, Pauline, was a homemaker, and her father, James, was an oil field contractor. She graduated from W.B. Ray High School in Corpus Christi, where she was voted the most beautiful by her classmates in her freshman, sophomore, junior, and senior years. And between 1965 and 1968, she went to the University of Texas, where she studied microbiology before switching her major to art. In her freshman year of college, she was named one of the 10 most beautiful co-eds on campus. Now, this was the first time that a freshman had ever been chosen to that honor. After that, her photos were sent to various agencies in Hollywood. A Hollywood agent named David Marish called her and urged her to come to Los Angeles. She politely turned him down, but he continued for the next two years to relentlessly try to get her to come to L.A. Finally, in the summer of 1968, Farrah moved to Los Angeles, initially staying at the Hollywood Studio Club with her parents' permission just to try her luck at the entertainment industry. Now, when she arrived there, she was 21 years old, and she signed with Screen Gems, and her salary was $350 a week. She initially be began to appear in commercials for such products as Noxzema, Max Factor, uh, the Mercury Cougar automobiles, Beauty Rest mattresses, and there was a whole bunch of others. But she basically was used as a person that, that did commercials. Um, initially, she was not in any television or movie shows. Then eventually, she started getting some TV spots. She was on The Flying Nun in 1969. She was on I Dream of Jeannie. Uh, she was on Owen Marshall, Counselor at Law. Uh, she was on Mayberry RFD. She was on The Partridge Family. But her face was getting out in the magazines uh, when she was doing the Noxzema commercials and the Max Factor and the Mercury Cougar commercials. So, and people were aware of her face and her hair. In 1976, a guy named Ted Trachillis owned a poster company. Now, if you'll think back in the 70s and 80s, posters were really popular. Everybody went into Spencer's Gifts in the malls and bought posters. Well, this Ted Trachillis that owned the poster company wasn't familiar with Farrah Fawcett. But that changed when the son of a neighbor of his suggested creating a poster featuring Farrah. And the reason he came up with the idea was that there were so many men in his dorm that were going and buying women, women's magazines and cutting the pictures of Farrah out when she was in shampoo ads and posting them on their walls. She was getting the attention of all the men just from being in, in the women's uh, ads. So the poster company seized the opportunity and they reached out to Farrah's agent to get her to do a, a poster. When her agent told her about the idea, Farrah agreed to it right off the bat. She felt like it was a cute idea and that it would get her better involved in the process of becoming a star. Now, from the start, Farrah was the one that exerted control over the photographs. She was the one that chose the ones that she liked. The She did all her own hair. She did all her makeup. And it was actually, the picture was actually taken at her house in L.A. The swimsuit that you see, the iconic red swimsuit, was hers. Um, the blanket that you see behind her as a backdrop is actually a Mexican-style blanket that the photographer had in the back of his car. And he tried this at the very end of the day to add a, a different color and variety to the shoot. And this 
worked perfectly. The photographer and the poster company wanted her to wear a bikini. And she refused to do it because she evidently has a scar from childhood that was on her stomach. And she didn't want that to appear in the picture. So she chose to get her own swimsuit and, and use this red swimsuit. Now, there were about 80 pictures that they pulled out out of like 20 different rolls of film. And then they finally narrowed it down to a, a, a few pictures. And, and the one that, that we're so familiar with is the one that won out. Now, th this is actually, this swimsuit is actually in the Smithsonian Institute. This created a star. Every guy wanted a poster of this in their room. Every guy just idolized her and, and thought she was gorgeous. And every woman wanted to have hair and makeup like she had. She was definitely the most popular girl in the 70s. Now she went on to star in Charlie's Angels, which was a popular show during that time. Ironically, she only stayed for one season. Now, Farrah actually earned more money in royalties from the poster sales the first year than she did on Charlie's Angels. She left Charlie's Angels to basically get on the big screen. And she wasn't a runaway success in, in that, but she was in, in a lot of movies. In 1984, she played in a movie called The Burning Bed. And if you've never seen this show, this she is that's when you knew that she was an excellent actress. After that, the one that really sticks out in my mind is a movie called The Apostle. Now, to me, that is without a doubt her best acting job. Uh, she just is is so over the top in that show. She stars in it with Robert Duvall. Now, Farrah was in a long-time relationship from 1979. Uh, she was involved with Ryan O'Neill. Um, they had a son that's name was Redmond James Fawcett O'Neill. He was born in 1985. Now, O'Neill and Farrah Fawcett's relationship was always a volatile one. There were split-ups. There were make-ups. Farrah's son, Redmond, has just been in constant problem with the law. And I think at the time of this recording, he's, he's in jail facing a fairly stiff sentence. In 2006, Farrah was diagnosed with cancer. Uh, she began treatment, uh, had chemotherapy, and had surgery. They initially said that she was cancer-free, but then shortly after, the cancer came back. Now, she made a documentary of her life after cancer. I have not seen that, but somebody says that it's just amazing. Uh, it goes through the, the process of, of her getting sicker and sicker and trying to beat this disease. Fair Fawcett died at 9.28 a.m. Pacific Time on June 25th, 2009. She was 62. Ryan O'Neill was at her side. She left about four and a half million dollars to her son in a trust. Uh, he doesn't sound like he'll see a penny of it because he's in prison. But uh, he's, if he'd just get his life together, he'd be set. What an iconic image Farrah is for the 1970s and, and 80s. Everybody remembers her. You, you don't at have to attach her name to it, as long as you've got a picture of her, or a picture of her hair, you know exactly who it is. Farah is buried at Westwood Village Memorial Park in Los Angeles. Westwood is a really small cemetery. I've been there quite a few times. She has one of the larger areas. Uh, there, I don't, there are some specific areas that are kind of like little courtyards, and she has one of those. There is no date on her her tombstone, just her name. There's a few others that that are like that, like Rodney Dangerfield has a courtyard uh, type setting. 
Uh, and this is the same cemetery that Marilyn Monroe is buried in, and so many other actresses and actors. This is like a who's who of, of Hollywood. Thank you so much, Farah, for all the fun times you gave us through the 70s. And uh, there's a lot of guys that sat and drooled over your poster. Rest in peace. Thank you guys for watching.